All right. So it is Tuesday, April 18th. It's kind of hard to believe that we are halfway through the month of April already, more than halfway. And so let's go ahead and just do a quick level set on where we're at in addition to uh, the minor change in our schedule. So we are now able to see the entire remainder of the semester here. So we've got Monday, August 17th. That was yesterday. It was module seven exam was what was due. So we're meeting tonight. We're meeting two, three, four. We only meet five more times. That is it. Uh, and so the shuffle that we had is that lab 747 and lab 748 got pushed back so that we could give everyone some extra time uh, to go ahead and get the uh, VMware sorted out and installed uh, and up and running. And so um, 747 and 748 are not due until this coming Monday, April 24th, and you'll have a single lab activity uh, which will be lab 836. And we'll be talking about that lab tonight. We're going to be talking about model-driven programmability. And we're going to dig in initially with Yang and take a look at Yang data models and explain what Yang is and, and go over uh, how the data models are put together. And then we'll find out what exactly we can do with those different data models. And so that's what we've got on tap for this evening. So we've got three labs that'll be due Monday. Uh, and then as you can see, the remainder of the semester, we have uh, two weeks out, we've got construct a Python script to manage WebEx teams, which will be lab 867. And then you guys have uh, two packet tracer activities. And these are pretty low impact activities that actually walks you through everything you need to do. And then we've got the modulate exam. And then for the final week, we've got the project, project 869. And that'll be uh, on Tuesday, May 16th, which is our last synchronous session that we'll have like this over Zoom. That will be when each group will present their activity number five, and then that will be a wrap. And then you guys will have the rest of the week to complete the hands-on skills assessment. And remember, the hands-on skills assessment is already available, right? So you can already download that and start working on that hands-on skills assessment. The Cisco final exam will be activated um, on Monday morning, May 15th at 6 a.m. And you'll have seven days uh, with which to take that final exam. And so remember, the final exam, you get a single attempt on the final exam. That's it, right? And unfortunately, I, I can't control the number of attempts because we can only activate it for one attempt. So you get a single attempt on that. Um, and also remember that you'll have, and let me, looks like my thing timed out here on me. Let's get off that page. So you'll you'll also have, um, and these have already been activated as well for the maximum number of attempts, uh, you'll have the ability to take the practice exam. So not only the CCNA DevNet practice exam, but the course uh, final exam exam practice test is available. And those are available to you now. So again, you've got five to six weeks left in the course. You're going to have multiple attempts on, and actually, let me go back over here, I'm trying to pull the exams up here or get to the, the main page here. So you've got the certification practice exam. Uh, and you can see that's available until the end of the year. So why not take that and take it as many times as you can? You've got the practice final exam right here. That's activated till the end of the year. 
So you've got multiple attempts with that. So maybe each week you take the practice final exam once a week and you take the certification practice exam once a week. That way, when you get to the actual final exam, you're all ready to go. And again, that practice final exam and the certification practice exam, those are already activated. You already have access to those. And so you can begin taking those, right? So I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you get in as many attempts as you can. Uh, and then last but not least, we've got, I, I'm going to make sure I bring this up. You've got the hands-on skills assessment. And I believe this makes up uh, around 20% of your grade. So if I was to pull down this document real quick here, and it looks like it's going to open up for me. And so here it is, right? And you can see it's 100 points, and it's going to have you perform a series of tasks. And you'll be filling in the blanks here, right? And in, in a lot of instances. And then you're actually going to be creating some code, answering some questions. You can see here, latitude, longitude, you would fill these things in. Uh, then you're going to investigate some stuff. So there's nothing preventing you from starting this uh, at your earliest convenience, and so I would definitely start taking a look at that. You can see here is the, the Dev ASC Skills Assessment Python file, which you're going to be, and let me go ahead and pull it down here real quick. And it's going to open it up and let's see what we got going on here. And I think I've already put this out in um, one form or another in terms of the student will. And so here are the things that you're going to be doing, right? So again, import libraries for API requests. You guys know how to do that already. The JSON formatting, you know how to do that. Epic time conversion or epoch time conversion, you know how to do that. Complete the if statement, right? And ask the user for a WebEx access token. You guys know how to do that. Um, provide the URL to the WebEx team API. And so you can start putting this together, right? And kind of filling in. And you can see they're going to tell you right here, replace me with hard-coded token, okay? And you can see they're going to say, replace me with URL. And so this is something that you can actually start on and get going on. And again, the support videos are already out there. So the reason I want to bring this up, whoops, let me get away from the discussions there and the announcements. Let's go back to the syllabus. The reason I want to bring this up is because as we get closer to the end of the semester, right? We've only got five weeks left to go in the course. There's going to be a lot of activities coming down the pipeline, right? So, and, and again, chapter or module eight is one of the more difficult modules just due to the nature of the material that we're going to be covering, okay? So, uh, let's go ahead and, and well, first let me ask, so any questions on the schedule, the logistics and what we've got coming up in terms of activities due um, and when those activities are going to be due, the fact that you have access to all the practice exams right now, so you can take advantage of those. Remember, you're going to need a 70% or better on the final exam. Uh, in order to earn the discount voucher, right? So I would definitely prep as best you can for that final exam. So any questions on anything we've got coming up here? All right. So if there's no questions, let's go ahead and let's dive into some of the material. And... That is what we're going to be looking at here in just a second. And what did I put in there? Okay, there we go. All right. So let's talk about module eight. And I'm going to start at 8.3 uh, because 8.0, 8.1, 8.2, .8 uh, it's going to be a lot of reading. They're going to cover, Cisco likes to talk about all of its product offerings. You're going to see a ton of that. And then they're going to talk about 
the SDKs, right? Or the software development kits. And so that's one of the first things that I wanted to bring up uh, is, and actually, let me see. And now I'm wondering if I actually put it in here. I don't think I did. So uh, they show you uh, one of the, the WebEx team's SDK. And in fact, let me, did I drop that in here? There it is, WebEx me, I think it is, dot .py. Okay. WebEx me dot .py. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So we're going to start to, we'll talk a little bit about WebEx here, but then we're going to transition to Yang and to NetConf. And that's really going to be our focus uh, tonight is we're only going to talk about NetConf. Next week, we talk about RESTConf, right? And I, I want to separate them because there's a lot going on with the NetConf lab and what you're going to be asked to do. And let me make sure that I'm still, whoops. And we shouldn't be looking at Chrome here. We should be talking about that in a second. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I've got this teed up here. There we go. So here's my CSR 1KV, right? So I'm just making sure that that's still teed up and ready to go. All right, so back out here. So let's take a look at this Python script here called webxme.py. And this is one of the first things they talk to you about uh, when they're showing you the the WebEx. And I'm sorry, this is not. Hold on one second. That is not what I thought it was. Okay, so give me one second here. I apologize. And we'll see the AACC. And I don't see it here. All right, well, this is definitely odd because I did pull it together. All right, so I'll leave the SDK part off. I was gonna run it to show you what it would do using the SDK because I wanted to talk about, uh, we were gonna take a quick look at getting that token, right? So when you're working with WebEx, remember, uh, that we're going to go to, and we can pull up this here, we're going to go to developer.webex.com, right? And you should have this WebEx account set up already. Uh, and remember, when you go to log in, and we'll click on log in here, and you would put your email address in, and you would go ahead and sign in. And now when you get signed in, it's going to bring you to sort of a documents or documentation page. Uh, with a list of all kinds of resources that you can get to. And if you click on documentation at the top, it's going to bring you here. And we're going to come down to APIs, right? Because we're interested in accessing the API. And when you click on access the API, this is where the bearer token resides. Now, this is also one of the um, annoying things is that that token is going to be good for 12 hours. And then you have to come in here and get a new token, right? So if I was to pull up uh, the course, let's see, module eight here, and let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and we're going to pull up that uh, WebEx SDK. This little script right here, right? And you'll read about this in module eight, two. So, and this is what I was going to run. So we'll just, we'll recreate it here. So let me back out of here and I'm going to put it into, put it into the Yang folder here. So I'll just call it uh, webxme.py. We'll paste it in here. 
All right, and so all this is, is a very simple Python script that's using the WebEx team software development kit. And so from that software development kit, we're gonna import the WebEx Teams API and API Air libraries, right? Now we need this access token here. And again, remember, this is one of the more annoying things is that if you work on it one day, when you come back 24 hours, 12 hours later, you need to drop in the new bearer token that is here and they hide it here. But if you click on that and copy it and you, um, you can see right here, 12 hours after logging into that site, that token is going to expire. So I'll paste it there and you can see that the token is really, really long, right? So there's the token. Uh, and all we do is we're creating a variable here. Variable name is access underscore token. And it's going to be assigned the value, which is a string. And that string is that bearer token that we get when we log into developer.webex.com. We go to documentation and we go to the API section, right? So we, we're going to create another variable in the script. It's going to be called API. And that's simply going to be the WebEx Teams API. And we're passing it our access token, right? And here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to use the API to get the people, specifically me, and that's a method there to get me. And we're going to capture that in a variable called me. So this try accept, this is a Python construct here. It's going to try this, right? If this doesn't work, then we're going to get this error, this API error. And it's going to print out whatever the API error is that we would receive if we end up with an error. And what I can do is I'll pull uh, the number six out of the script here. And so all this is going to do is it's going to get my email, right? So print me dot emails. So it's going to print the email that's associated with my WebEx account. So let me come down here because I always like to Put that in there. So let's save that and let's go ahead and say Python 3 WebExMe.py. Uh, and the WebEx Teams SDK is not found. So let's go ahead and make sure it should have been installed. So we'll say pip3 install WebEx Teams SDK. And so that should have been installed because I had installed it earlier and maybe it was on a different virtual machine and not this Mac. And so that's how, so the, you have to install the WebEx Teams SDK. And it looks like the requirements were already satisfied for a number of things, uh, but we'll let this thing finish up here. And then we will attempt to run it again. And that's what we should get right there, right? And you can see it just gave my email address because again, we were saying, go ahead and get for me the email address associated with my WebEx team account. And so the WebEx Teams Software Development Kit or SDK allows you to do all kinds of very cool things. And you, like I said, you could do a Python script to do that. And I'll show you the script one more time. And you can see that it didn't take a whole lot of code. Again, the most complex part is making sure you get the access token in there. And then remembering that 12 hours from now, that access token is gone. And so using SDKs, right, or software development kits is one way that you can interact with WebEx teams, right, with Cisco. Now, after they talk about the SDKs and they show you the, this example, they transition and we're gonna talk about model-driven programmability. Now, what is model-driven programmability? Well, it's nothing more than using some sort of a data model, right? And Yang provides us with data models that model networking devices. And that's what Yang was created for, right? And it stands for, I believe it's yet another next generation is what Yang stands for. And so 
Yang gives us access to a model. And that model describes networking devices, right? So you could think of it as like, you could have a model that would describe a human. It could be that every human has a height, right? Every human has a weight, a name, right? Um, a location of some kind. And so it's just a way that we can create a model. And you can also think of it almost like an object in Python where we use the objects, right? We create these objects and they have attributes. So if you created a car object, it would have attributes like color, number of doors, no, you know, uh, standard or automatic, things like that. And so the Yang data model, Yang data models, I should say, do pretty much the same thing, except they describe networking devices. And that, again, is what they were created for. So you might be wondering, okay, well, what does a data model look like? So for that, Let's drop over here and we're going to go to GitHub, All right? Let me back up a second here. And so this link is in one of the labs that you don't have to do, uh, describes where you can go look for these Yang data models, right? And uh, there's a wget command that I'll, I'll run and show you how you can pull this one down. Now, there are two types of Yang data models. One is the open data model, and the other is the native data model. And it's pretty easy to differentiate the two. So the open data model is the IETF, right? And there are other organizations as well. But the Internet Engineering Task Force, right? And they sort of create these generic Yang data models that describe a networking device, right? And so what does a networking device have? Well, it could have interfaces, right? And then those interfaces have characteristics or attributes like the speed of the interface, the name of the interface, the description on the interface, right? So these are things that interfaces have. And so that's really what these models are all about. So in one of the labs that, again, you don't have to do, it brings you here to this, I, oops, sorry, to this IETF interfaces.yang. So if I click on raw, right, it's going to give it to us in a format like this. So what you could do here is you could copy and paste this uh, into a file. I'll show you how to use the wget command to pull the file down. Uh, but again, if I was to search in this file for IETF, right, you can see that it occurs quite a few times in this file, right? So if we scroll down a little bit, we've got this container, right? Now, the chapter also talks about, in Module 8, it's going to talk about the things that make up Yang, right? So you've got the open model and you've got the native model, but then you've got the the different, um, what's the right word? I, I guess, do you think of it as nodes, right? The different nodes for data modeling. You've got leaf nodes, container nodes. And so here's a container, right? That's called interfaces. And in here we have list a list node. And the list node is the interface. And the key, right, is that the interface has a name. And then there's a description, right? And the file, I think this is like 750 lines long. But when you use pi, uh, pyang, which will give us a, a tree, look at this, instead of having to look at the raw data like this, um, it, it breaks down to like 35 lines, right? There's just You can see the comments. There's just a lot of comments in here. But this is a data model. You can see here a leaf node, which is description. And what is the description going to be? It's going to be a string. 
And then here's a description of what it is, a textual description of the interface. A server implementation may map this leaf to the if alias MIB object, and this was an SNMP reference, right? And so, but they give you the comments take up a lot of space here, right? And so then here's another leaf node and it's the type, right? Identity reference. What type of interface is it? Is it mandatory? That's true, right? So it's a mandatory characteristic or mandatory node. And so this is what a Yang data model looks like. And this is actually right here in the Cisco GitHub area, right? Under Yang vendor Cisco, iOS XE, and then 1693, which is an older release, but it's a good reference. Okay, so what can we do with this? Well, we can pull this file down. And if I was to come over here and let me see if I can wget, I think I got it in here somewhere. Or did I pull it down? Yeah, so I don't see the W get here. And that was pulling other stuff down, which is odd. All right, so you can copy and paste it. I thought I had the W get command in here. I see that I do not, but that is okay, right? Because I copied and pasted the raw Yang data model and put it right here, right? So if I was to say, cat ietf interfaces you can see that this is the same yang data model that we were just looking at so python has a utility <clears throat> excuse me called p yang and i usually just say pi yang right so it's p y a n g and we can install that using pip right you can say pip install p yang and this should say that the requirements are already satisfied. Yeah, because I've already installed it. And so what we can do with PYANG is we can actually operate on those YANG data model files that we just looked at, right? The one for 16.9.3, which is, and that was only for interfaces, right? That was only for interfaces, what we saw there. So what I could do is I could say PYANG minus F, and this is going to be the format. And I could say tree, and then I give it the name of the Yang file, right, for the interfaces. Now, remember, the IETF is considered open, right? So it's kind of generic. There are vendor-specific Yang files that you could look at as well. And we'll take a look at those in a second. So as you can see, when I run that command, we come up here. And it's only about 35, 40 lines long. It is not that long at all. And it gives us a much nicer uh, format to look at in terms of a file. And so I'm looking for my drawing tool. Where, there it is, ink to go. And so what do we have here, right? So at the very top, you have the name of the module, right? So right here where it says module, that is the module name, IETF interfaces. And let me make this a little thinner. IETF interfaces. So that right there, that is the name of the module. And the next thing we have is a container, right? And so the container starts here at interfaces and comes down to right there, right? So this is a container and the container is called interfaces. And inside of the container, you can have leaf nodes like the name or the description or the type. And then you can have keys, right? So this is our key here, this read write interface. Um, asterisk is our key. And so those are how the, the values for the Yang data model are described in a tree format. Now, when you see this question mark here, remember that's optional. Obviously, read write or RW means read write. 
R-O would mean read only. And so then what do we have here? Well, we have another container and that container <laughs> goes way down, but we have another container called interfaces dash state. And in that container, we have a list, right? So here's the list on the inside and the list references leafs, right? So here's a leaf and that's the data type, right? String, identity reference, enumeration, 32-bit integer. And so again, these are all read only. Now, that's our open Yang data model. Let's talk about a Cisco specific data model. And so for that, I would just come back over here. I could go to iOS XE. Oops, sorry, I want to go to 1693. Didn't mean to jump off there. So go to 1693 and you can see they have all kinds of different iOSs listed here. So here are all of the Yang data models. Again, we were just looking at the IETF open Yang data model for interfaces on a network device. But let's take a look at this. So Cisco IOS XE BGP, right? So the Border Gateway Protocol has several Yang data models as well. And then we've got CDP, right? The Cisco Discovery Protocol has its own Yang data model. And other things that you might be familiar with would be possibly EIGRP, which is a routing protocol. OSPF, here's one for HTTP. So if you wanted to um, manipulate the configuration settings on a Cisco device running iOS XE, uh, we've got interfaces. So here's the Cisco native. And so these are all native Cisco Yang data models. And again, that these are different from the IETF open data models. You know, so if I clicked on this and we wanted to take a look at the interface, you can see right away, it looks very different, right? Because you've got all the Cisco information here, and then we've got a bunch of revision information. And so if we fly by that, you can see that this is custom tailored to a Cisco device. Now they've got threshold information on packets per second, bits per second, right? All kinds of fast ethernet, gigabit ethernet, five gigabit ethernet, port channel, 10 gigabit ethernet. So these are all things that you're finding in the Cisco native. Again, they're gonna highly customize this for Cisco devices, right? So again, just remember there's two types of Yang data models, open, which would be your IETF, which are generic and supposed to apply to all the vendors, Cisco, HP, Juniper, Huawei, um, whatever other networking vendors are out there that support uh, the Yang data models, right? And not so much support the Yang data models, but that support NetConf. Uh, so again, these are the Yang data models. So the next question, which obviously is going to come up, is, okay, well, that's great that we've got these data models. What is it that we're supposed to do with these data models? And let me make sure, and I think I'm going to have to, all right, am I still over here? Am I still logged in? Okay, good. So I'm still logged in. So the question becomes, well, what do we do with these Yang data models? Well, Again, if I pull back the page here, and let's get rid of that, and let's pull up this, and let's go back to 8.3. So we look at this here, and let's take a look at the image from the course real quickly, because it's a really good image. So right here, what is Yang? Right. So here is the model-driven programmability stack. And you can see at the very bottom, right, the foundation of this is obviously going to be those Yang data models, because without those Yang data models that are creating a model of a network device, there's really nothing we can do without, right? So this is the foundation. So the transport 
is how am I going to possibly connect to make communicate, you know, to establish communications with a device that supports model-driven programmability, right? Well, I could use SSH or HTTP. And then how is the data going to be encoded? Well, for NetConf, it's going to be XML. And so tonight you're going to, you're going to, you're going to get your fill of XML, right? With RESTConf, it's going to be, RESTConf could be XML, but we would use JSON. So you could use JSON. And the protocols that we use to communicate with the devices, right, that the devices are going to support are going to be NetConf and RESTConf. We don't, gRPC is there, but we don't actually dig into gRPC at all. And you can see from the, the, um, the left-hand column there, we're interested in RESTConf, NetConf, and Yang, right? So we can go ahead and create a script using NetConf and what's referred to as the NC client, the NetConf client uh, in Python. And we can use the operations that NetConf supports, like get to retrieve um, device information, right? Or get config to get some or all of the configuration. We can do an edit config, right? So there's things that we can do using NetConf and the Yang data models. And so let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at what that might look like, right? Now that we understand you know, what Yang is and what it's all about and where the data models are located uh, in order to go ahead and communicate with that device, right? All right, so to do that, this is where we're going to come back over here. So this is my CSR 1KV. And, and so for these activities, you would need to have the CSR 1KV running along with your dev ASC virtual machine. So if I say show IP interface brief, you'll see the, the IP that we're interested in is this very top one here, the 192.168.1.129. So that, that is the IP address of my CSR 1KV. And so let's see, can I communicate 192.168.1.129? Whoops, 129. Can I ping that device? So I've got communications to or communication with that device, right? So let's start out by making sure that we can SSH to that device. Remember from that stack that I showed you, right? It's Yang, and you've got the data data uh, models at the bottom, open and native, and then right above that we've got the transport, right? Which is how are we getting there? And so SSH, right, is, is one way to do that. Um, and then it showed you HTTP. So if I was to say SSH to Cisco at 192.168.1.129, let's go ahead and see if we can connect. And the password, yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually, is it Cisco? I don't remember the password, Cisco123 exclamation mark. There we go. All right, so Cisco123 exclamation mark. So I can get onto the device, right? Okay, great. So we can get onto the device. Let's clear the screen here. And again, I'm on my Dev ASC virtual machine now. And actually, whoops, actually, let's go back onto the device because it's the device that needs to support NetConf, right? So what we could do is say show platform, software, Yang management, and proc to see what processes are running. So, oops, sorry. So this is the process we are very interested in right here is the NetConf SSHD, right? And so that's the NetConf SSH daemon. Remember, we look back at this, right? We've got Yang data models down here. So what's the transport gonna be? Well, with NetConf, we're using SSH. Our encoding is going to be XML, and the protocol that we're going to be communicating with is NetConf, right? And you're going to see there's an SSH command we're going to run with a minus S, 
And what that's going to indicate is, yeah, we're connecting with SSH, but it's over SSH that I'm, I want to use NetConf, the protocol NetConf for those communications. And as you can see, we've got a lot of other stuff running here, right? But we're really interested in just this guy right here for now. NC for NetConf SSHD. All right. So we're on the router. Let's go ahead and type in. And if, if it didn't say running, you would say config T. And we would say NetConf dash Yang, right? And you can see that we've got some other things after this, but you would just simply say NetConf dash Yang. So we've confirmed that that's already working. So let's go ahead and just exit out of here. And now we're back onto the dev ASC virtual machine. So here's that SSH command I was talking about. So we're going to say SSH, oops, not minus L, SSH Cisco at 192.168.1.129. And we want to connect to a specific port number. And remember, port 830 is the NetConf port. And here's that dash S. And what we're really doing here, because that, that is typically not a valid option with SSH, but it is here because this is how we're telling SSH, right? The transport. Yeah, we want to SSH over to that router and we want to go right to port 830 because that is where the NetConf SSH service resides, is on port 830. And we want to use the NetConf protocol for this conversation. So we're not going to see the, the, the CLI for the router because we're telling this SSH command, no, we want to use NetConf, right? And so here's what's going to end up happening. We're going to type in our password of Cisco123 exclamation mark. And we get all of this stuff, right? So this is the hello message, and this is the end of the hello message right down here, where you've got that bracket, bracket, greater than, bracket, bracket, greater than, right? And it says that there's over 400 lines here. I'm going to go ahead. We're not going to count those lines. We're just going to go ahead and accept the fact that it's over 400 lines. But as you can see, this is different from the router CLI, because remember that command that we ran the SSH command, we told SSH that we want to communicate via the NetConf protocol. And so this is us manually connecting, right? So now the lab is going to show you uh, some hello information that you can send back, right? So you can send a hello message to the client. Right, and you would copy and paste that code uh, in here, and then it would show you that information. So while we're connected up here, if I was to go over to the router and take a look, right, take a look at what's happening here, we've got messages that are popping up that are showing NetConf over SSH, and hopefully you guys can see that here on my screen right? NetConf over SSH. And that is what we want. So if I said show NetConf dash Yang sessions, we should see that there's an active session here. And that's the session that we have going right now. Now your, you know, the session ID of 31, your number is probably going to be different than my, than the number that you see on my screen. And so Again, if we go back to the Dev ASC virtual machine, it's from here that you could then issue a git command using the open IETF netconf, um, or I should say, um, sort of Yang data model in order to get information on the interfaces. And it's going to give you that information back in XML format, right? And so we're going to see that in just a second here. So again, what I'm showing you now is how you would manually do this. And they, they have you do it manually uh, just so you can see 
how you would do it manually. What you're what in reality, what you're going to do is you're going to do it in you're going to do it in a script of some kind, right? So you can close the session, right? I just did control C, uh, but you can also send an RPC message and you'll see in the lab, when you get into the lab, you'll see that you can cut and paste the, the XML code and you can drop it into the lab or into um, the, uh, the interactive session that you have there. All right, so let's go back over to the CSR 1KV. And if I say, um, show netconf-yang session, you can see there are no active sessions anymore. That's because I terminated it with a control C, right? Okay. So that is how you would manually connect. So let's do a quick level set here. So we talked about Yang data models. There's the open and the native. The native being, in our case, Cisco, right? But then there's the open, which is the IETF, which are generic models that are supposed to just model any network device. And we can use NetConf, we can manually connect to a device, and we can establish an interactive NetConf session via that SSH command. And then we could send in XML code, right? Remember, we look back over here. Right? So we've got the Yang data models. We're using SSH. We're going to encode our conversation, right? our interaction with XML, and we're going to use the NetConf protocol. And it's really that straightforward. So let me ask, are there, you guys have any questions over anything you've seen to this point? The models, the transport, the encoding, and the protocol. Netconf. What do you got? Does anything come to mind? Okay. So no questions. So that's a good thing, I hope. So, oh, wait, we got a question in the chat that just popped up. Okay, not right now. Okay, good. All right. So that's working with Netconf, but that's working with Netconf manually, right? And that is as you could see, and when you go into the lab, you'll see that that's probably not how you're going to want to do that if you're going to use NetConf. So obviously, right, the whole data, uh, the model-driven programmability is we're using the model, the Yang model, and we want to make it programmable. So we would use Python in order to do that, right? And Python has a module that makes it super simple to interact with NetConf, and it's called NC Client. And we simply use that NC Client module in a Python script to automate what you just saw me doing interactively, except you're going to see a lot more when we do it with Python. So... To do that, we'll be on our dev ASC virtual machine. And remember, the CSR 1KV needs to be running at this point, right? So let's go ahead and say PIP3. We're going to check for some modules here, but we should have everything we need. Columns, I put them more. And so what we're looking for is, do we have NC client? In fact... We come down to the N and LMN, and there we go. Whoops, sorry. And there we go. And you can see we have NC client. In fact, to make that a little bit easier, instead of more, I could have grepped on NC client. And if it was there, which it is, it's gonna it's gonna give us that line that we're trying to match. And also, you can see here we can do um, Python three minus M pip install upgrade because it looks like I'm behind on my pip version so we can go ahead and install the latest and greatest version of pip and let's run this again Oops, sorry not that again let's run this again here and there we go so that's a quick way to see on your dev asc virtual machine if you have the python nc client installed right okay 
So we're in that labs devnet source netconf directory. As you can see, I've got a ton of stuff in here and you're going to have a lot less than this, but these are some of the things that we're going to walk through and take a look at here in terms of the script. So what does NC client do for us? Well, let's take a look at the very first script here and then we will break after that we walk through this here. We'll take a quick break. All right, so what do we have here? All right, so we've we, we've already confirmed that we have NC client installed. So from NC client, we're going to import the manager, right? The netconf client manager. Now, this is probably, this will come back to you quickly because I, I don't think we've talked about Python here in a week or two, but what are we doing here? All we're doing is we're creating an object and the name of the object here is just M, the lower letter, lowercase m. And it's going to get the value of manager.connect. And so this object is going to connect to that host on that port using that username and that password. And it's not going to verify the host key. And so if you look at this, right? We just did that manually with that SSH command. That is what we did. So if I was to pull the SSH command back up here, and hopefully it's not too far gone here, right there. So take a look at that SSH command that we manually used to, to establish a netconf session with our CSR 1KV. That SSH command is right here. And we're just creating an object, right? And again, that object is then going to be, it's going to have attributes, right, of the connection, the session that it's created here. And so then we can use that object, right, to get the attributes. Like, what are the server, and it's kind of interesting here, right? So we say m dot server underscore capabilities. What we're really saying is, in our case, it's router capabilities, right? But it's the netconf server that's running on the router. And so we say, give me the attributes that are the server capabilities. And that's all we do here. So for capability in M dot server capabilities, which means it's going to go through every single capability that's line by line. And we're just going to print out those capabilities. And that is all this Python script is doing, right? Again, we could have used, you know, they use a lowercase m here. We could have used whatever, right? You could have named the object anything you wanted to, but you need to make sure that if you change the lowercase m up here, when you create the object, that you change the name down here as well, right? Because it's the object from which we want the attributes, right? Give me the server capability. So let's run this. And remember, this is just a Python script now. And so we're totally um, making this a programmable operation and one that could be automated but that I don't have to type the SSH command in and then get into that, you know, the funky XML and all that stuff. So here's how we're going to get this information. I'm just going to say triple zero. I'm going to hit enter. And there is a list of all of the capabilities, right? So let's take a look at some of the things you see here. And I thought I saw OSPF earlier. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I almost went right by it. So you can see we've got some OSPF, MIBS, right? You've got MPLS, right? Multi-protocol label switching. There's some IPv6. So it's showing us all the capabilities that NetConf has on our router, right? IANA address family. And so we're seeing all kinds of information here. Now, if we look back over here at our CSR1KV, take a look at what just happened. 
user Cisco authenticated successfully from this IP address, 192.168.1.147, with a source port, right? Some random high ephemeral 39,006 for NetConf over SSH, right? And we saw when we looked at that stack, you got the Yang data model, the transports SSH, and we're coming in over SSH using the protocol NetConf. And so that's how we can see all of the supported capabilities that the router has. All right, so we're at a good spot here actually, because now we're gonna get ready to, oops, sorry. We're gonna get ready to go into the next script that we have. And that is gonna be, I think it's 001. And I think there's a couple 001s. Yeah, there's all an NC client. Let's take a look at that. Or actually I wanted to go to, let me do this here. We didn't wanna do that. We wanna do more 002. All right. And actually we just did that. It should be 003. Yes. All right. So this is where we're going to change things up a little bit. And you can see I've commented out over here. I've commented out the capabilities because we don't want to see all the capabilities. We're actually going to go after the running config. But here's what we're going to do. So any questions on anything you guys have seen up until this point? And so what we're going to do next is we're going to get the config, right? Because we've created this object. And the object is a netconf session over SSH. And that object has attributes. And we're now parsing, right, or pulling those attributes from the object, like supported capabilities. And now we're going to be pulling the configuration down, the running config for the device. So what questions do you guys have about NetConf over SSH so far, and the NC client library. And again, the Python scripts are very straightforward, very simple. All right, if there's no questions, we're going to go ahead and grab a 10-minute snack and bio break. So let's come back at 8.09. So 8.09, we'll come back. <laughs> Let me pause the recording here. All right, so we are back and we left off with the NC client module for Python. And again, from that NetConf client module, we're importing the manager. And you think of it as like the connection manager. And we're going to create an object. And the name of that object is, again, it's arbitrary. We could name it whatever we want. Here, it's just using the lowercase letter M. And so an object, right, has attributes, and we know that. And we just listed out with the m.server capabilities, we listed out the server capabilities attribute, which lists out all the things that the NetConf um, server on the CSR1KV is capable of. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use a method, right? So instead of listing out attributes, here we're using a method called get underscore config. And when you're doing the reading, <clears throat> excuse me, for module eight, you'll see that <clears throat> get underscore config is one of many methods that can be used uh, with NetConf. And so what is the source of the config that we want, right? We want the running configuration. And then we're going to capture that right? What the output of that method is going to produce, we capture that inside of a variable called netconf underscore reply. And then we just simply print the reply out. Now, little trivia here, what format is it going to print out that, that netconf, that running config in? So what do you think? What format are we going to get that printed out in? 
And I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about that. Yep, Christy and Dylan are spot on. It's going to be XML. So let's go ahead and run that. And we're going to give it a second. And there is the running config for that CSR 1KV. And now if we look in here, you can see that we've got some loopback interfaces, right? So we're seeing, you're seeing right here, loopback interface 705. That's the description, the type, right? It's, again, IETF, uh, Yang data model down to the interface type software loopback address, we get the IP, the whole nine yards. But again, when you get something in in a format like this with all these tags, I mean, this is just, that's unbearable, right? Absolutely unbearable. So you probably are asking yourself, well, there's got to be a way to get it to print that out in a nicer format. And there is, and it's going to be called uh, too pretty XML, right? And again, this is just something that we can uh, import, right? From XML, we're going to import uh, a module, and then we're going to use this too pretty XML in order to get it to print it out a little bit nicer. And so let's take a look at what that might look like. So here's that same script, but you can see right down here. I commented out this line right here that was printing out sort of the raw, let's think of it as the raw XML where it was just a complete mess and it took up, you know, left to right, top to bottom, every, every square inch of my terminal window with XML code. Now we're going to run, whoops, sorry. Now we're going to do this. We're going to say print and up at the very top, you can see we import XML domain or XML DOM mini DOM, right? So we import that and lo and behold, it has a method called too pretty XML. So we use this print statement. We're going to print out XML.DOM.MiniDOM.Parse string because that XML data that we were getting was a string. And so we're going to get that netconf underscore reply right, dot XML, which is this variable here, but we're going to get it, drop it in here and tell it it's XML and to prettify, prettify it, right, to make it look nice. And so let's run that. So we'll say Python 3, 0, 0, 4. And now what's going to happen is we're going to get the running config, but it's going to format it for us, right, with indentation and the whole nine yards. So if I scroll up just a little bit here, we should see all right, so here we go. We've got an interface, and the interface name is Loopback706, and there's the, the interface description, and there's the um, IETF Yang data model for the interface type. And is the interface enabled? Yeah, that's true. IPv4 information. So there's your IPv4 address. There's your net mask. And then, you know, the closing tag on the address, the closing tag on IPv4. IPv6, no information. And then that's it for that interface, right? And so all of those loopback interfaces that are configured on here, if I scroll back up, you can see that that's all of the information that NetConf is able to pull out. So you theoretically, with this little script right here, and my window, hold on, it froze on me there. So with this little script right here, which is not a whole lot of lines, right? One, two, probably about 10, 12 lines right there. You could actually create a backup in XML format of the running config on your Cisco router, right? By simply using this get config method and telling it source is running, right? 
So pretty nice. And you can, like I said, you can also, like we just prettified it. And so it printed it out. All right. So what it wants us to do now, right? Or what you guys will be doing here is let's go to 005. All right. So now, right, we got that whole running configuration. Well, maybe I don't want the whole running config. Maybe I'm just looking for something specific, right? So what we can do is we can create a filter. And that's what you see created right here. So again, oops, sorry. So again, this is commented out, right? You got the triple quotes and then the triple quotes. We've still got our, there we go, scroll up. So we're still importing from NC client. We're getting the manager, right? Then all this is doing is think of it as like a connection manager. This is creating an object that is a netconf session with the router. And we're still importing that xml.dom.minidom because it looks like we're going to prettyfy something else down here. So we've got, we create a net comp filter, right? And what does that filter say? Well, that filter says, I want that Cisco iOS XE native information, right? From the running config. And you can see right here, source is the running config. And then we have a comma, and that's where we now add this filter, which we know that the filter is this information right here. Uh, and again, remember it's XML. And so we're have we have the filter opening tag and then the filter closing tag that we're going to be supplying. And so what this should give us is it should give us the um output. We should see the version of uh, the Cisco device and let's go ahead and run this. Let me clear the screen here. So let's say Python three and zero zero five. All right. And so it's going to display the native Yang model and it's going to reduce the amount of output, although that's going to be kind of tough to see here. Uh, but you can see Right, there's some OSPF info there. And if I keep going back up, right, there's the IPs. And you can see it's in a little different format, right? Because now we said, give it, give us the information, right? We're still going to get it in XML, but we're getting the native information. In fact, let me rerun this and let's pipe it to more, which I probably should have done the first time knowing how much stuff it's going to pump out to the screen, but here we go. So give me the native information, right? The native Yang data model information using the Cisco IOS XE data model. So you get the version, right? 1612. You got some processor information. You can see the path, right? There's the username and password for <clears throat> excuse me, the user Cisco, you get the host name, right? And we're going to be messing with this here soon and we're going to be changing that up. So again, this is the native model. So if you were to run this command, right? Or run that script and pump the output to a file. So there's nothing that says I can't do this, right? If I can pipe it to more, I can do this, right? And say, you know, my CSR backup. Dot XML. So we run that command, right? It's going to run the script. And then if I say my CSR backup XML, there you go. So you've just created a backup script using netconf that creates a backup of the running configuration of a router, right? So again, actionable and that's one of the things I like about a lot of the labs that you do in the course is this is actionable stuff that can be used in production, right? Or in your lab or whatever the case may be to back up the configuration of your device. And it does it in a programmatic way, right? Using that model-driven programmability. All right. So we've seen how to manually interact with the devices. We've seen how to 
create a script using the NC client module and the manager, right? The connection manager to create an object that allows us to get information from the Cisco device. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to configure, right? We're going to program the device by doing, I believe, the host names. Let's take a look at 006 here. All right, so we commented that out. We've got our filter there. Ah, here we go. Netconf underscore host name. So we are going to set the host name of this device. And so before, remember, we were looking at the capabilities first, right? We looked at the attributes of the object, specifically the supported capabilities. Then we saw how we could get the, the running configuration. Then we saw how we could use a netcomp filter to give us the native Yang information, data model information in XML format. Now we're going to use edit underscore config. So instead of get underscore config, this is edit underscore config. And what are we editing? We're editing the running configuration, right? And what is the config that we're passing in? It's just simply the config is netconf underscore hostname. Whoops, sorry, let me get that out of there. So here is that section of configuration using the native Yang data model to change the hostname. And this is how we would do that. In fact, let's go ahead and... Uh, what did I call it? I called it uh, my CSR backup. So if we go into the CSR backup, right? Remember we captured the output here and it wasn't too far down here where we saw right there. So there's the open tag and there's the close tag for hostname. Now, if we want to change that, which is what we're going to do in the script that we're getting ready to run, let's go into 006 here, come down to the bottom. So here's the host name here. So you can see we say, yeah, we want to use the native Yang data model approach and host name is what we're going to change. And I'm going to put a new host name in here. We'll call it Travs Cool CSR 1KV, right? So let's make sure, let's save our file there. Let's make sure here, if we come over to our CSR 1KV, the host name is what right now? You can see that the host name is some net, what do I got going on here? Some net W host name. So, okay, it's got some net W host name in here, but watch what happens when we run our new script. Let's clear our screen. We simply say Python 3, 006. I hit enter and we should get an okay message here when this runs telling us, and there it is, right? So you can see we're getting back the RPC reply. And you can see right there, we get the okay. Well, if that's the case, then when I come over here, there it is, Trav's Cool CSR 1KV. And you can see it gives us a little log message here, right? Comes to the screen and tells us, hey, configured programmatically by process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, from console as netconf, right? Coming in as netconf over SSH. So the router is actually telling you hey, I've just been programmatically configured. And so that's how we can change the host name. And so then this opens up a whole host of things that you could tweak, right? Or that you could change. And so let's take a look at the next one. In fact, before we do that, any questions so far over what you've seen, right? If the last script that we ran was this guy here, right? So instead of git config, right, or instead of getting attributes 
uh, from the object, we're now editing via that connection the, con the running configuration. So any questions over anything? Does this does it make sense so far what you're seeing? Right? I know the XML kind of makes it a little difficult. But does it make sense what you're seeing? Anybody still there? Okay, good. All right. All right. So that's how we edited the host name, and we were able to change the host name of the CSR 1KV. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do something a little more complicated. Whoops. So we're going to take a look at 007. And again, these, I've written these. Okay, so there's our net comp filter. That's still in there, even though we're not really doing anything uh, with that. The uh, supported capabilities thing, I just left that in there so we could see like, oh, okay, hey, that's what we were doing earlier. So there's our netconf underscore host name. Now we've got this netconf underscore loopback. Now I put it in this format right here to show you that unlike the JSON or the YAML data that we've dealt with in Python, programming and let me get to the bottom here real quick where are we at it should there it is okay so here is our net conf loop back because now what we want to do is we've configured the host name now we want to configure a loop back address on the router and so what i want to show you here and the reason i left it like this is that indentation with the xml is irrelevant xml doesn't care about the indentation what is it that XML cares about? What do you guys think XML actually cares about? If it doesn't care about the indentation, what is it that matters in terms of how XML gets interpreted? What do you think? Any guesses? And the answer is actually there highlighted. Yeah, Christy, you're right. So it's it's the tags. It's the XML tags. And remember, these open parent, closed parents, right? Like, that's an XML tag. And you can see it closes way down here at the bottom for the config. So we're telling it, this is what we want to configure, is this loopback interface. But let me do this. Let me jump in here. So let's VI007, and let's go to the bottom, and let's change the loopback name, right? Because loopback1 already exists. So we're going to call this loopback999. I think we should be okay with that. Description. Again, we could put a new description in here, and you'll notice I wiped out the tag, the closing tag there. So we'll say, you know, my new loopback. All right. For the IP, let's make it something interesting here. We wiped out the, the greater there or the less than there. So we'll do 9.99.9.99. Make sure I get the tag back at the little less than sign. We'll leave it as a slash 24. And everything else looks good. So let's come down here to the bottom, right? So what are we doing? Well, remember, the, the, the lines with the pound signs are commented out. So here is where we say we're going to capture the netconf reply is going to get m.editconfig. And so we're going to set that loopback address. And then we're going to go ahead and print out the running config. So we're going to set the address and print the running config out. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say, whoops, sorry about that. Let's say Python 3 and 007 
And what we should see is an OK. Oh, and uh, the config did not, or I'm sorry, This is and this is what it prints out, because this is the response that we get back, right? So sorry, not the running. We didn't get the config. We're getting the response back from our configuration and what we did. So we don't see the running config. Or again, I could have uncommented the line out above it. We would have seen the running config, but we get this. So if this is true, right, when I come over here onto Trav's cool CSR 1KV, and I say show IP interface brief, we should see at the end of the loopback addresses, loopback 999, and there it is. And so that's how you could configure an interface, right? So again, pretty cool. And we're doing this all with netconf. We're using, in that case, we use the Yang native Cisco data model using the SSH transport because we're using the NC client Python module to create a connection, a managed connection object that then we interact with programmatically. And that is model driven programmability right there, right? That's all it is, right? That's all it is is us writing Python scripts using a transport to get to the device and then using the NetConf protocol. That's it. All right. So that was 007, and we confirmed uh, that it was there. So in the lab, it's going to ask you to create an interface with or try to create an, a, an interface with the same IP as another interface. Now, this was interesting, right? So if we were to VI 007. So if I was to come up here and say, okay, we're going to create um, loopback. Where are we at here? Let's create loopback 888. And I don't think I have that loopback created yet. And I'm going to leave the IP address the same. And let's go ahead and run this. Say Python 007. So again, I'm trying to create a loopback. Oops, sorry. I'm trying to create a loopback that has the same IP address as the loopback we just... Holy Toledo, hold on one second here. There we go. That we just created. And let's see what it tells us. There you go, right? So the last line is the telling line here. NetConf client operations RPC error. Inconsistent value device refused one or more commands. And the reason for that is because we already have a device with that IP address, right? And so it's, it's not going to work. Not going to work. Okay. So let me clear the screen. All right. So is everybody good so far? We know how to get some attributes like the supported capabilities. We know how to get the configuration. We know how to edit the configuration. We know how to change the host name. We know how to add a loop loopback address, or it could be, you know, as long as you have the interface, it could be the IP address on the interface. So let's see what happens if I do this. What if we pull up 007? And now my question is, what if I want to change the IP address on loopback 999? So I don't want it to be 9.99.90 uh 9.99.9.99. I want it to be 99. Nine dot ninety nine dot nine. So I just switch the octets around there, right? So what if I wanted to have that IP address? Is this going to change the IP, or are we going to get an error message, or is it just going to do nothing? So if I say show IP interface brief, and we come all the way down here to the bottom, you can see right now it's it's the number nine is first, then ninety nine, then nine, then ninety nine. So let me ask you guys, what do you think? Are we going to get an error? Let's take a quick poll here. Are we going to get an error? 
are we going to change the IP or is it going to do nothing? What do you guys think? What does everybody think is going to happen here? All right, Dylan says he thinks we're going to get an error. Christy, Dwayne, Anj, Nathan, what do you guys think? Are we going to get an error? Is it going to work or is it going to do nothing? All right, Christy says error. And Dwayne is not sure. Anj says not sure. All right, let's run it and find out. So here we go. Let's see what happens. All right. Well, we did not get an error message. It came back and it said, OK. All right. Well, if that's the case, let's go back over to the CSR 1KV. You can see here, configured programmatically. And it gives us all that cool information, letting us know that, hey, you know, something was just programmatically configured on this router. Let's say show IP interface brief. And let's put the show command in there. Oh, it's doing this. Hold on. It's doing this thing where it's putting in extra character show. Whoops. IP interface brief. I'm typing too fast. And we go all the way down to the bottom. And there it is. It just changed. Uh, it just changed the IP address on that interface. Okay. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So... Let me ask you this. Let's go back into 007. And you can see we've got this native infra or the, the native Yang data model, right? We've got the description in there. Um, and we actually, we didn't look at the description. Uh, so let me, I apologize. So it's going to say, if I was to say show run, ah, it's lagging behind here. Show run interface loopback 999. You can see, right, it says my new loopback and the interface is up. So when we look back over here, right, we've got that primary information in there. We've got the address. We've got the, 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 uh, the subnet mask. So here's my question. This really isn't interactive, right? So what if you wanted to change a loopback address, right? Or let's say you had a series of loopback addresses. Would there be a way to automate, or I shouldn't say automate, but make it interactive, right? So that what you're doing would be interactive. And I think that that is going to be this guy here. So let's take a look at this script here. So what does it do? Well, it from NC client, it imports the manager, right? We import this E tree from LXML. We import the XML.DOM mini DOM because that we can do prettify. And then we import random, right? So here's our device. We list out the device that we're going to be working with. And this is, remember, what are we creating here? This is just a dictionary. It's a Python dictionary that has our router the username, the password, and the host verify false. Now, we'll come down here to this RPC section where we're using the open Yang data model on interfaces. But what do we have? Well, we've just got this placeholder here. Remember, when we did the format method from the... Uh, from the string class, we would use the open brace, close brace as a placeholder. So the interface, there's just a placeholder there. And we come down here and you can see we've got some placeholders here. So loop back and it's got the open brace, close brace. And then the interface, loop back interface for the description, open brace, close brace. 
The IP address, the net mask, we're going to make it a slash 32, but the IP address also has a placeholder. And this is our loopback template, right? So let's come down here. And so here's what we're going to do down here. So we can create a random IP address. And that is the code right there to create a random IP. And that's why we imported random because we're using the method random integer and we're saying, give us a random integer between one and 255 for each of the four octets. And so here's what I'd like to do. Let me copy this. Right, so if I copy this, and again, this is just create, it's an F string. So it's gonna create the IP address. If I was to step out to, I think, come on over here, I think, what do we got going on? Not much going on over here. So let's say Python 3. And let's get into the interactive interpreter, right? So if I was to say control and paste this in here, ah, and it, wait, it didn't get the whole line there? Huh, should have gotten the whole line. Give me one second here. I should have got the whole line there. And all I'm trying to do here is just to pull this little snippet of code out so that you could see, because the, the challenge at the end of the lab, all right, so let's get this back here. And let me go ahead and see if this is going to take it or if we're going to have problems with this. Okay, so it looks like at the end of the line, and we're not missing much there. So let's let me try this right here. So let me do this, pull this up, because that's the part we're missing right there. So m dot ran in one comma two fifty five, and oh, we're about to import random here. All right, so we're going to import random there. We're going to call that command back. I'm going to hit enter, and I'm going to say ip underscore addr. Right, so that code could generate a random IPv4 address for you, right? Now, if I run, so if, if I type IP ADDR again, right, it's going to give us the same address because we ran the command up here to create that random address. So if I want a different random address, I would have to run it, whoops, run it again. And then the value for IP underscore ADDR is going to change. So that would be the code that you could use to generate a random IP address. And you can see it's doing a pretty good job of generating random IPs. So if we go back over here, right? And we're going to do an RPC call. And this is going to allow us to configure, right? You can see right here, m.edit, edit underscore config, and the target's the running config. And we're using the config variable, which we create up here with this rpc.format on loopbacks. And the loopbacks just gets the loopbacks XML, right? And we're getting that information in XML format so that we can pass it in. Now, here's what's interesting, right? When I do this, I can't do more than two or three uh, loopbacks at a time because the router can't handle, I tried to do a hundred at a time, a <laughs> hundred, and it certainly doesn't do that. So I had to back it off to do like just two to three, right? So let's go ahead, let's VI 012. Uh, and let's get the rest of that in there. And let's change these random, the range of loopback addresses here. So let's make it 950 to 952. And so all we're going to do here is create loopback interface 950, 951, and 952. And each of those is going to have its own randomly generated IPv4 address. All right, let's run it and see what happens here. Hopefully it's going to work with three. So we'll say Python 3, 0, 1, 2. 
hit enter and we didn't see anything come back. Let's take a look at our CSR 1KV and see what we've got here. And again, something was configured programmatically. Let's say show IP interface brief. Ah, it keeps missing the show. Interface brief. And let's see, do we have 950, 951? Oh, I'm sorry, it cap that's right. The on the right hand side, it caps, it doesn't include 952. So 950 and 951 got created, right? Let me show you what happens if we try to get crazy and create maybe too many addresses. And this may be something you run into, so don't panic if for some reason, I'll say 955 to 975. And this is guaranteed to probably not work. And so I wanna show you what happens when you have failure here so that you don't panic thinking, something's wrong with my CSR 1KV or I can't get in or it's not able to handle things. And there is no way this should complete. There we go, okay, good. And so what you see here is it says device refused one or more commands. And it's, again, it's not that syntactically in that file something was wrong. It's simply uh, that I had too many things going on at one time. So if we come over here, right, and I say show IP interface brief, whoops, keeps leaving that out, interface brief, and we float down here, you can see that none of those IPs from 955 to 975 were ever created. <laughs> and so again, <clears throat> excuse me, you just have to be uh, moderate in what you're trying to do, but don't panic if you get something like this here. It doesn't mean, and again, you guys saw, it doesn't mean that there's something syntactically wrong because watch this. It just means we're trying to do too much and the CSR just didn't like that. So if I was to say 973, so this should this will create loopback 973 and 974. And let's run it. And we and you see when I get the prompt back like that, no error message. That's what we're looking for. And show IP interface brief. There we go. And we'll come on down and we should see 973 and 974 have been created with random IPv4 addresses. And so when you get to the end of the lab, right, there's that challenge section in there that's asking you to come up with something new, right? It's asking you to come up with something new. So let me give you another idea. Remember, we output the configuration of my CSR 1KV in XML format here. And we're using the Cisco native Yang data model, right? And you can see they even give you like a little link to click on here. So what are some of the other things you might be able to put in here? Maybe you're gonna add a banner message of the day because there's not one in there. So wouldn't it be cool to add a banner in? So here's the XML tags you would need and you would put your banner in here. What about, where's the other one at? The users, username. Maybe you wanna add a user in programmatically. How would you do that? Well, there's the XML, right? You would create that you know, netconf underscore new user variable in your Python script, have it inside the triple or the, yeah, the triple quotes. And then here's your XML that you could use to configure that. And so when you send, if we look back at uh, 007, right? So you see where we created the filter and here we create this netconf underscore loopback. Maybe you create a netconf underscore new user and then drop in the code, right? Starting from, whoops, where it says inter, ha, ah, sorry. Where it says interface here, this is where you would start and drop in the username code all the way down to closing the interface tag and put it in between the native and the config. 
And at the top, you know, at the very top up here, it had the native. See if I can go back up without scrolling off the screen. There we go. So you're going to have the config as you're telling it, hey, I'm configuring this thing. I'm using the, the native Cisco Yang data model, right? And then in here, you would put that MOTD banner XML code or the username XML code. And then you close it out. I'm sorry. The native, the native and config down here are closing. Uh, oops, sorry. They're closing these two up here. So from where it starts with interface down to closing interface, this is the XML you would add in. You could add in. And since as part of the lab, you're generating the native, when you do the filter and you get that native uh, Yang Cisco data model, you can then look in there and see, well, what XML code would I need to paste right in here? Call it netconf underscore whatever it is you're trying to change, netconf underscore MOTD or banner, netconf underscore username, add a new user, add a new banner, right? And then down here where you have, sorry, down here where you have your netconf underscore reply that you could capture, your config would equal netconf underscore MOTD or banner, whatever you called it up above there, or netconf underscore new user. And that is how you would print. And then you you know, you know print out the response that you get back and you can prettify it if you want. Again, if it works, the response isn't a ton of XML. So, but those are great challenge ideas right there. Or add a new loopback address or maybe add two or three loopback addresses. So again, you don't, and you don't have to do the random thing that I did. You could simply put all the XML code in like right here, instead of saying, let me get back up here. Instead of saying netconf underscore loopback, you could say netconf underscore loopback 99, and then put all this code in and just change the IPs. Put a new description in. And then netconf underscore loopback 100. And then down here, you just have these Netconf reply, you could have multiple edit config statements. So do you guys have, does it, does it, does what we've covered tonight make sense? Does it give you a better understanding, a better feeling around what model driven programmability is all about? The model part of it is the Yang data model. And it basically, there's two types, the native and the open. The native is a generic for all you know, networking devices and the IETF runs that. And there are others, but the IETF is the one we're interested in. And then there's the native, which we've been doing here, right? With Cisco. And so you can use whichever one you want. You know where to find those and where they reside. You know how to print them out as a tree kind of format there. Now we know how to use the XML code in order to change these values. So does that make sense? And hopefully it's going to make some more sense. And yeah, Christy says somewhat. And hopefully it'll make more sense as you guys work through it. And don't be afraid, again, to create multiple scripts that are making changes, right? Maybe one of your scripts changes a loopback address, like I like the way that I had it kind of broken out there. Like one script changes a loopback address or creates a new loopback address. Another script changes the host name. Another script is going to put a new user in there. And then you could start to kind of combine things and, and play around with stuff. All right. Well, that is pretty good time. Uh, Dwayne, if you hang out, uh, I will talk to you after everyone drops. And if there's no questions, that is all I have for this evening. All right. Well, uh, let me stop the recording.